Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video we will be learning about a new topic that is immunity. To begin with, let's understand the term immunology. Now for that I am taking an example. Here you can see a person and here are certain microorganisms. Now if these microorganisms enter this person's body, there can be two types of reactions. One is the person can either be infected and exhibit certain signs and symptoms. Second is this person's immune system can show resistance to these microorganisms. So basically, immunology here is the study of specific resistance to further infection by a particular microorganism or its products. Immunology can also be termed as the science which deals with the body's response to antigenic challenge. Now, antigens as we know are toxins or substances which cause an immune reaction in a body. Now, these immunological mechanisms provide protection to our body against the infectious agent but periodically it can also cause some damage. Concising the points that we learned under the introduction of immunology, immunology is the study of specific resistance to further infection by a particular microorganism or its products. Immunology is also the science which deals with the body's response to antigenic challenge and immunological mechanisms provide protection of body against infectious agent but periodically it can also cause damage. Now what are the applications of immunology? First of all, it helps to understand the etiology that is a cause and pathogenesis of diseases like rheumatic fever and asthma. It helps in diagnosis of disease which is possible using ELISA and other tests. It helps in the development of vaccines, treatment using specific antibodies, transplantation and blood transfusion, helps in immune surveillance and it helps to find the future susceptibility of people to diseases with the help of HLA typing system. Next, let's understand the term immunity. Now, immunity is the resistance offered by the host to the harmful effect of pathogenic microbial infection. Now, immunity is further classified into innate immunity and acquired immunity. Innate immunity is the one that is present since birth, whereas acquired is the one that we obtain during our lifetime. Now, innate immunity is further divided into non-specific and specific immunity, whereas acquired is further divided into passive and active immunity. Now, both passive and active immunity are again subdivided into natural and artificial immunity. So, we'll be learning about this in detail. Now, let's learn about innate immunity in detail. Innate immunity is a basic immunity which may be genetically passed on from one generation to the other. So, it's basically the immunity that is present since birth. It does not depend on prior contact with microorganisms and it may be non-specific when it indicates a degree of resistance to all infection. For example, plant pathogens rinderpest. Now we all know that plant pathogens rarely affect human beings. Innate immunity can also be specific when it shows resistance to particular pathogens. Now, innate immunity is further classified into species immunity, racial immunity and individual immunity and we will be learning about it in detail. So, let's look at species immunity first. Now, individuals of the same species show uniform pattern of susceptibility to different bacterial infection. Now, what this means is, for example, humans, we humans belong to one species that is we are homo sapiens. Looking at dogs, they belong to another species. Now, there are some diseases that affect our human species like poliomyelitis, syphilis, measles. Now, they occur only in man and they cannot be seen in the other species. Similarly, there might be other diseases that occur in these species but they do not occur in man. So, that kind of differences in immunity is known as species immunity. Now, let's look at the mechanism of species immunity. There are certain physiological and biochemical differences between the tissue of the host species that determine whether a pathogen can multiply in them. That is, our species, that is Homo sapiens, we have a different physiological and biochemical tissue structure than those of other species. So, that will determine whether or not a particular pathogen can infect us or not. Moving on to racial immunity. Within a species, different races show difference in susceptibility to infection. Now, we know that we as Homo sapiens, there are different races like Asians, Negroes and so on. So, here we have taken the example of Negroes. Negroes are resistant to yellow fever and malaria. 
Now these racial differences are genetic in origin and they are induced by persistent environmental stimulus. Moving on to individual immunity, individuals within a population show variation in response to microbial infection. For example, you can take the uh, example of COVID itself. If two or more people are exposed to the virus, it's not necessary that all of them could get the virus. It depends upon each individual's immunity. So another example of individual immunity is that of homozygous and heterozygous twins. If there are homozygous twins, there can be similar degree of resistance seen in them for lepromatous leprosy, whereas it is not seen in heterozygous twins. Now, what are the factors that affect individual immunity? First is age. Now, two extremes of life, we know that small children as well as old people are most susceptible to infections. Second factor is hormonal influence. That is like endocrine disorders like diabetes mellitus that can have a greater susceptibility to getting infected. Third is nutrition. Defective nutrition increases the risk of infection. Concising the important points under innate immunity, it is a basic immunity which may be genetically passed on from one generation to the other, it does not depend on prior contact with microorganisms, it may be non-specific or specific, innate immunity can be further divided into species immunity, racial immunity and individual immunity. Looking at the points under species immunity, individuals of same species show uniform pattern of susceptibility to different bacterial infection. Mechanism is due to the physiological and biochemical differences between the tissue of host species which determine whether or not a pathogen can multiply in them. For example, poliomyelitis, syphilis, measles occur only in man. Many a time, sa same species of bacteria may produce different types of infection. For example, sa Salmonella typhi produces typhoid fever in man, but the mice is resistant. Concising the important points under racial immunity, within a species, different races show differences in susceptibility to infection. Negroes are resistant to yellow fever and malaria. And the racial differences are genetic in origin and induced by persistent environmental stimulus. Looking at individual immunity, individuals in a population show variation in response to microbial infection. Example is homozygous twins show similar degree of resistance to lepromatous leprosy. And it is not seen in heterozygous twins. The factors influencing individual immunity are age, hormonal influence and nutrition. Now let's learn about the mechanism of innate immunity. We have epithelial surfaces and tissue defenses. First let's look at the epithelial surfaces. Our intact skin and mucous membrane that covers our body provides protection against bacteria. It provides a mechanical barrier and it also provides bactericidal secretions. Now let me explain a term called colonization resistance. As you can see in this picture, this shows the intestines and we know that there are certain microbes or microflora that are present in our intestine which prevents super infection by coliform during antibiotic therapy. Now this kind of resistance that is offered by the predominant normal flora to infection is known as colonization resistance. Now let's learn about tissue defenses. Now if the barrier of our body that is the epithelial surface is overcome by the microorganisms, a number of factors in the normal tissue as well as in our body fluid play their role in immunity. Now these tissue factors are divided into humoral factors and cellular factors. We will be learning about it in detail. Now before moving on to the humoral factors and cellular factors, let's revise the things that we learned under the mechanism of innate immunity. We have epithelial surfaces, that is the intact skin and the mucous membrane covering the body provides protection against bacteria. They provide a mechanical barrier as well as they provide bactericidal secretions. Now there is a term called colonization resistance. It is a resistance offered by predominant normal flora to infection. Example is intestinal anaerobic microflora that prevents super infection by coliform during antibiotic therapy. Then we have tissue defenses. That is if the barrier of body is overcome by the organisms, a number of factors in the normal tissue and body fluid play their role. Now these tissue factors are divided into humoral factors and cellular factors. Now let's learn about the humoral factors. What do you mean by the term humoral factors? They are the factors that are transported by the circulatory system, that is our blood. And it includes lysozyme, C-reactive proteins, bactericidin, propridin, beta-lysin and basic polypeptides. 
Now, lysozyme is a bactericidal enzyme. It is found in our nasal, intestinal and lacrimal secretions. C-reactive protein is an important protein that appears in the blood of people with tissue necrosis and inflammation. And it plays an important role in resolution or in resolving the inflammatory process. Now let's learn about what is acute phase proteins. There are some proteins in our plasma that are collectively called acute phase proteins. And there may be a sudden increase in the plasma concentration of these proteins as a response to infection or tissue injury. Now this response is called the acute phase reaction and the examples of these acute phase proteins are interleukin 1, interleukin 6, tumor necrosis factor and C-reactive proteins. Now they have a role to prevent tissue injury and they promote repair of inflammatory lesions. After having learned about the humoral factors, let's now look at the cellular factors. Cellular factors includes a process called phagocytosis. Now the process of phagocytosis consists of four phases. Let's look at the first phase. Now the first phase involves the approach of the phagocyte to the microbe by positive chemotaxis. Here you can see that this is the phagocyte and this is a microbe. And the first phase involves the approach of this phagocyte to the microbe. Now the second phase is absorption of this microorganism on the surface of the phagocyte. Third phase is the submergence of this microbe into the cytoplasm of the phagocyte as you can see here. And the fourth phase is intracellular digestion of the engulfed microbes. Now the phagocytic cells may be microphages or it can be macrophages. Now the example of macrophages are polymorphonuclear leukocytes and the example of macrophages are histiocytes, monocytes and reticuloendothelial cells. Here I have concised the points under cellular factors. Phagocytosis process consists of first phase which involves the approach of the phagocyte to the microbe by positive chemotaxis. Second phase involves absorption of the microorganism on the surface of the phagocyte. Third phase involves the submergence of the microbe into the cytoplasm. And the fourth phase involves the intracellular digestion of the engulfed microbes. Now the phagocytic cells can be microphages and macrophages. Now after phagocytosis, inflammation and fever are the other two cellular factors. Let's look at inflammation. We know that when a tissue injury occurs or when there is an entry of a bacteria or other organism and when it creates an irritation in our tissue, it leads to inflammation. It is an important non-specific mechanism of defense. Looking at fever, it is a natural defense mechanism, it destroys the infecting organism, it stimulates the production of interferon and helps in recovery from viral infections and the substances which cause fever are endotoxins and interleukin 1. Now after having learned about innate immunity, let's move on to acquired immunity. It is an immunity that is acquired during the lifetime of an individual. Now the difference of acquired immunity from innate immunity is that it is not inherent in the body but it is acquired during the lifetime. It is specific for a single type of microorganism. Now acquired immunity may be active immunity and passive immunity. Now let's look at what is active immunity. The resistance that is developed by an immunity as a result of antigenic stimulus is known as active immunity. So the person is actually given an antigenic stimulus and the resistance is developed and that can be of two types that is natural active immunity and artificial active immunity. In natural active immunity, the immunity is acquired after one infection or recovery from disease or subclinical infection. For example, if a person is affected with COVID and then recovers, that person gets a natural active immunity. Second, we have artificial active immunity. This is where the example of vaccination comes in. That is uh, inactivated or you know, the strength of the virus is reduced and then injected. That is what happens in vaccination. So that is an example of artificial active immunity. It is acquired artificially by inoculation of bacteria, viruses or their products. That is living organisms like smallpox 
or organisms killed by heat or phenol, toxoid, non-specific protein therapy, and auto vaccine. Concising the points under acquired immunity, the immunity acquired during the lifetime of an individual is known as acquired immunity. The difference of acquired immunity from innate immunity is that it is not inherent in the body but acquired during life and it is specific for a single type of microorganism. Acquired immunity may be active and passive. Looking at active immunity, the resistance developed by an immunity as a result of antigenic stimulus, it can be natural active immunity or artificial active immunity. Natural active immunity is acquired after one infection or recovery from disease or subclinical infection. Artificial active immunity is acquired artificially by inoculation of bacteria, viruses or their products that is living organisms like smallpox, organisms killed by heat or phenol, toxoid, non-specific protein therapy and auto vaccine. So we already learned about active acquired immunity, now let's learn about passive acquired immunity. Here the subject is immunized by prepared antibodies and body cells do not take any active part in the production of immunity. It is of two types that is natural passive immunity and artificial passive immunity. Now in natural passive immunity there is transmission of antibodies from the mother to the fetus through placenta and it may also be through the way of colostrum and milk during the first few years of life of the baby. Moving on to artificial passive immunity, here the immunization is passive and it is produced by the injection of serum of animals that have been immunized actively. Examples are antitoxic serum, antibacterial serum and convalescent serum. Concising the important points under passive immunity, subject is immunized by prepared antibodies and body cells do not take any active part in the production of immunity. It is of two types that is natural passive immunity and artificial passive immunity. In natural passive immunity, the transmission of antibodies from mother to fetus is through placenta and it may be by the way of colostrum and milk during the first few years of life. Looking at artificial passive immunity, the immunization is passive and produced by injection of serum of animals that have been immunized actively. Examples are antitoxic serum, antibacterial serum and convalescent serum. Now let's look at vaccinations. We have already learned that vaccination is an example of artificial active immunity. Now artificial active immunization is produced when live attenuated that is live weakened or dead organisms are introduced into the body. Now these vaccines are classified into live attenuated vaccines that is the organisms that are weakened for example smallpox, yellow fever, polio and BCG. Now there are killed vaccines that is examples are woofing cough, cholera, polio and anti-rapic. Then comes toxoid that is an exotoxin which are treated with formalin and a formal toxoid of diphtheria and tetanus is an example for a toxoid. Then comes subunit vaccines which consists of immunologic mat immunogenic material such as capsid proteins. Next is the schedule of immunization which shows the time period and the vaccinations that needs to be provided. Finally, we have the hazards of vaccination that is local sepsis, serum hepatitis, fever, malaise, soreness at the injection site, arthralgia, convulsions and allergic reactions. To get the PDF notes of immunity as well as other topics of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics and other health science subjects, visit my website, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.